Greetings, this is Tony Arendt and this is FFS Online and On Topic. This webinar series brings distinguished members of the Georgetown faculty and distinguished alums to talk about the most critical issues of our day. It's produced by the Georgetown University Alumni Association in collaboration with the Walsh School of Foreign Service. And today we have a double treat. Not only do we have an amazing guest, but we have joining us the Dean of the School of Foreign Service, Joel Hellman, to welcome us and to introduce our guest. So ladies and gentlemen, Dean Joel Hellman. <laughs> well, thank you, Tony, for that uh, warm introduction. Um, and of course, you're all here to hear Margaret Wang, and we're excited that she's being joined. She's joining us today. I really want to start before I introduce her. I do want to let um, the alumni across Georgetown know, and the SFS alum, you know, the extraordinary commitment that's coming from within our community to really rethink critical aspects of Georgetown and SFS to bring an understanding of the struggle against racism and injustice as a core component of what we do. There was, in the aftermath of the killings of George Floyd and so many others and the Black Lives Matter protest, an effort within our community, what we eventually um, uh, produced as a call to action from within the community, from our students, from our faculty, from our staff, to actually bring the struggle against racism and injustice to the status of a core principle, a foundational principle of the School of Foreign Service. And given the fact that we are starting our second century um, and in our anniversary, centennial anniversary year, we were thinking so much about our founding and the values and ideas that led to our founding. The notion that thinking about how we integrate the struggle against racism globally and injustice globally into those foundational principles, I think has mobilized our community to think more seriously about who we are as a community, about what our values are, um, about what our curriculum teaches, about who we invite into our community in terms of the recruitment of faculty and students um, to engage in a real serious analysis, dialogue and action to combat racism uh, and to, to, to enhance our efforts to struggle against injustice. So it's been an exciting time, one in which there's a lot of ideas, a lot of engagement, a lot of excitement on the part um, of our students, faculty, and staff. And it's in that spirit that I want to let you know um, that we are reaching out to all of our alumni, engaging in these issues, um, and celebrating those who have made such an extraordinary contribution to these issues throughout the course of their career. And we're so pre pleased and privileged to have with us today someone who has really uh, built a career um, around this struggle. Margaret Wang graduated um, from the School of Foreign Service in 1991. She's currently president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which of course all of you know as being a pioneer across the United States um, in the struggle for civil rights and more broadly the struggle against injustice. Throughout her career, Margaret has really been a champion for social justice um, and human dignity, especially in advocating against discrimination and, in, and, and oppression in virtually all its forms. Um, prior to the SPLC, Margaret also served as the executive director of Amnesty International USA. She's been engaged with members of Congress on, on legislation and advocacy, as well as across the United Nations family uh, in the, in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. She's published articles and analysis um, on human rights issues. So she served uh, in a variety of different ways throughout her career um, to pursue uh, advocacy, to pursue action, and to pursue engagement. And so she's modeling the behavior that so many of our students aspire to, and I hope will inspire all of us to think seriously about these issues. So it's in that spirit that I'm so thrilled to welcome Margaret here to engage with our alumni community and to hear from her um, some of the issues that she's been engaged with, especially in this extraordinary time of COVID and the extent to which this COVID struggle is exacerbating some of the issues that she's um, uh, dedicated her life to. So without further ado, let me turn it over to the able moderation and questioning of our wonderful, indefatigable Tony Aaron um, to, to, to lead this dialogue and, and then to open it up to questions and engagement across the community. Welcome, Margaret. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for your service. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Over to you, Tony. 
Thank you very much, Joel. Really appreciate it and a, a very important welcome and also some of the very critical things that the School of Foreign Service in Georgetown is doing in this area. Uh, I wanna say that I knew Margaret when she was a student and um, I think that was, that seems like five years ago. I, I think Dean Hellman was wrong when he said you graduated in 91. He, he clearly was, was misspeaking. It, it just seems like it was, it was yesterday, but okay. I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Margaret to talk. And then I would encourage everybody to think of questions that they want to ask. Put your questions in the control panel. And after Margaret does an introduction for a bit, we will then open it up to Q&A. So Margaret, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Tony. And I have to say, Professor Aaron was one of my favorite professors at Georgetown. And we can go back a little ways and talk about all the fun we had doing Model United Nations and other such activities. But it's really great to be back in touch and to be listening to all the changes at Georgetown, which are really very inspiring. I thought I'd take a little bit of time today first to tell you about the challenge of democracy and institutional racism in the South, what it looks like today. Maybe a little bit about the work we're doing internally at the Southern Poverty Law Center as like so many organizations and institutions, we are wrestling with questions of racial inequity internally as well as externally. And then maybe I just have a few thoughts for those of you who are thinking about careers in human rights, in tackling racism and injustice. I thought I'd share what little wisdom I can offer um, in a few, few quick uh, comments. So first, in, in thinking about the South and in think, thinking about the challenges in front of us, it was W.E. Du Bois who said that as the South goes, so goes the nation. And the truth is that has been the case for many of the challenges that we work on. It is the place where slavery took hold. It is the place where so much of the destruction and genocide of indigenous people happened. It is of course the strong legacy of Jim Crow in the country. These are things that might have started in the South, but eventually became part of other parts of the United States. We saw the practices that began in the South, the laws that allowed those things to happen spread across the country. And so today, as we're thinking about how do we tackle these really big problems? How do we tackle racial injustice? How do we tackle issues of poverty and inequity? We have to start in the South. And that's why I took on this role at the Southern Poverty Law Center to really understand how we make change happen. We have to go to the source. For me, the South has been an eye opener. Um, I actually was uh, grew up in the South in East Tennessee, and I had not been back to the South for many, many years. I left to go to Georgetown uh, and I did not look back until this year. And I have been struck by what I've found. Um, many of you will know that the COVID crisis has created extraordinary levels of food insecurity across the country. But what we're seeing in the South is staggering, staggering lines of people in search of food. Um, poverty in the South continues to be one of the biggest challenges. The Southern states are amongst the poorest in the country. Mississippi has a poverty rate of practically 20% of the population. Louisiana is very closely following behind. And while the South only accounts for less than 40% of the US population, nearly 43% of all Americans living under the official poverty line live in the South. What's even more startling is near, nearly 84% of the persistent poverty counties counted by the US Census are all in the South. 84%. So these are rates of extraordinary um, deprivation. And there's a lot of connections to that. One is that the majority of Southern states have the highest numbers of people without health care coverage, far, far more than the national average. That is because many of those states have refused to do the Medicaid expansion option from the Affordable Care Act. And so it's left a huge gap for low-income adults who don't qualify for Medicare, but they're not making enough to actually purchase healthcare through the marketplace. Furthermore, um, Southerners tend to have more health 
chronic illnesses, more health challenges than other parts of the country. And so with the, the attack of COVID across the country, the South has really struggled the most. Um, many of you may have seen the article in the New York Times earlier this week about the difficulties of getting the vaccine to the rural areas of Alabama. Much of Alabama's population is rural. We, there aren't hospitals that are able to have the, uh, the, the vaccination for the pandemic available because they don't have the space or the refrigeration or the other things that are going to be needed to actually provide the vaccine. And it's worth noting that the lowest minimum wages in the country are in the South. A lot of the Southern workforce is actually in the minimum wage sector. Um, there are more women in the sector, in the in the employment sector in the South, and they are making the lowest possible minimum wages in the country. All of those contribute to a um, community, a, a group of communities in the South that are really struggling. They were struggling before COVID came along, but COVID has really wiped bare uh, the the disparate impact of the virus on the poor, but poorest people in our country. That's just one piece of the larger structural challenge in the South. The other thing that's worth noting is to talk about voting rights in the South. Many of you will know that the 2013 Supreme Court decision in the case Shelby County versus Holder actually removed protections that had been in place since the 1950s Voting Rights Act, oh, sorry, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and it allowed voter suppression laws that had long been prohibited by that law to now become officially law. And of course, Alabama was the first to jump into that fray, adopting laws immediately to require things like photo ID, um, to deny language access at the polls, to require exact match verification policies, um, to close polling places, particularly in communities of color, to gerrymander districts. All of, these, uh, all of these laws were introduced not just in the South, but the South was the first to push for those laws, to adopt those laws. And now we've seen it expanded across the country. I believe there are nearly 30, 30 states in the country that have adopted some form of voter suppression. So let me give you some consequences of that, those steps. In 2016, in contrast to 2012, there were 868 fewer polling places across the country. So within four years, 868 polling places where people cast their votes were closed. It's worth noting that most of these were shut down in minority and poor neighborhoods in the South. One of the most pernicious efforts has been the purging of voter rolls. We know that people who are young, poor, students, minorities may not vote in every election. And so when the Secretary of State requires that voters have to vote in every election in order to stay on the voter rolls, it then re results in a number of people who are un unknowingly removed from the, bo the voting lists. Um, to give you a sense of how significant this challenge has been, between 2014 and 2016, there were nearly 16 million Americans who were purged from voting rolls across the country. Now, sure, some of those folks might have passed away, might have moved to another district, so they're not all wrong. But let's consider the specific example of Georgia. In Georgia, the current Republican governor, Brian Kemp, was acting as the Secretary of State during the election when he was running for governor. In that role, he purged approximately 340,000 voters from the state's registration rolls. He eliminated close to 11% of all the registered voters in Georgia. And then it's worth noting, he won his election to the governorship by only 50,000 votes. So the implication of this is that these efforts, while uh, certainly on the surface, they sound as though they're um, unbiased and just procedural, end up having huge implications for which political parties are successful and which political parties have been less so. 
So that's just a snapshot. And as we're thinking about how we make our democracy in the United States a true democracy, we have to consider what are the structural barriers that have been put into place to disallow some communities from having full participation, to disadvantage some groups of people from being able to cast their votes or being able to find opportunities in employment or education to overcome the poverty barriers that exist in their communities. My organization, the Southern Poverty Law Center, we have about 350 staff. We're located in five states in the South and Washington, DC. Our states in the South are Alabama, our headquarters, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida. And like so many organizations right now, we fully recognize that institutional racism is also a part of our story. The organization is 49 years old. We will celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. And up until seven months ago, uh, we've had the same group of leaders of the organization for the last 49 years. The founders of the organization were two white men, lawyers, and they were joined by a third white man, a lawyer, um, to run the organization 20, 30 years ago. So that is a long time <laughs> for one leader to lead an organization or one group of leaders. And it certainly has had its fair share of challenges, both in terms of the treatment of colleagues, in terms of the perception of colleagues about how decisions are made and who gets to make them. And then of course, we just have all of the challenges that so many institutions have about the ways that we think about our work. For example, when I arrived, one of the things I realized is that we put a requirement in all of our job announcements for a certain educational degree. And yet that degree might not have anything to do with the role that we're posting for. That's a bias that is built in in many institutions that we have to shake up and challenge and really think about who are we excluding from opportunities that would be um, wonderful for them and wonderful for us as the employer. We have invested in the last uh, six months in hiring a new director of what we call JEDI, which stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. It's a variation of DEI that so many people have heard about. And this, uh, this initiative is actually something that sits in the executive office. It is not only to help our HR policies, our HR procedures, and really thinking about how do we change things like those job description requirements, but it's also to help us think about our work. Are there ways that we do the work that exclude certain voices? Are there issues that we should be working on if we care about voting rights or poverty that we're not currently considering? And whose perspective are we asking for when we're looking for solutions? It can't just be those of us in the organization. We have to turn to people who have been directly affected by these challenges. We have to learn from the communities where we are. So we're, we're bringing that spirit of inquiry, of asking questions about how we can do it better, about um, assuming that we have always a lot to learn, that we don't have all the answers yet. And I hope that's making our organization much stronger as we go forward. Maybe my last quick couple of comments are um, to offer some thoughts for those of you who are thinking about how does one get into a career where you end up at the Southern Poverty Law Center or Amnesty or any other of these social justice groups? It won't surprise any of you to hear that these days a graduate degree is often a must have for a lot of roles, even though I just said not all jobs require a, a, a particular degree. It is particularly true in the advocacy community that having some kind of graduate degree is really useful. So what's important for you is to consider what that uh, degree might be in. When I graduated from Georgetown, uh, everybody I knew was applying to law school. And I actually really desperately did not want to go to law school. <laughs> it sounded like a really long time to be taking classes in, in tort law or in uh, you know, issues I had no interest in whatsoever. 
So for me, thinking about a degree in international affairs or public policy made much more sense. And it's offered me a really incredible opportunity. Uh, many people felt when I was starting out that if you wanted to do human rights work, you had to go to law school. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think people are doing human rights work who might be going through social work programs or public health programs or regional studies. Um, all of those are opportunities where you can learn more about a subject and not exclude opportunities to do policy work or advocacy or social services or many others. Another tip I would offer is it's always great to have a little bit of experience inside government. I spent a couple of years in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I had the advantage of being offered a position through a fellowship in my graduate program at, at Columbia. And I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy it that much. <laughs> uh, working in Congress uh, was quite an interesting experience, but I have always appreciated that I have a much better understanding of how to make change happen because I spent my time there. And I learned a tremendous amount from my colleagues while I was there. So the opportunity to get that kind of, you know, firsthand experience in government will always serve you well. And you might discover that you love public service, but even if you don't, it will benefit you for years to come. And the last thing I would offer is that you should never feel that you're making a choice for your lifetime. When I got to Georgetown, I thought that I was going to go into the Foreign Service. I think that lasted about three months. And then I had no idea what I was going to do because I had spent all my time thinking about Foreign Service. Today, the options in a career in international affairs are extraordinary and large. You can do anything from business to academia to journalism to nonprofit advocacy, all of which can include the valuable lessons you've learned while at, you're at Georgetown. But at some point in my career, I realized I was spending a lot of time traveling around the world tackling human rights abuses, and there was quite a crisis happening here in the United States. In uh, 2001, two big things happened. Of course, the attacks of 9-11, which transformed the way I was thinking about human rights in the United States, and the birth of my first child. And so those big developments for me meant that traveling around the world wasn't quite the appeal that it used to have, and that there was a lot that I could be doing here. And that's the thing I would want to emphasize is that the work that I'm doing now, it is focused on the United States, but we touch on these issues globally all the time. Our work on hate groups and extremists requires us to be in contact with and collaborating with groups across Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, places where white nationalist extremism is growing in many parts of the world. And we can learn from one another and we can build alliances just as those people we're trying to counter are also building those global alliances. And this is true across the board in any of the issues that we've talked about today. So I hope that that encourages you to think broadly, that you're not, you're not choosing that you have to go in one direction or just take one particular um, role and, and future direction on, but you actually have choices. And you can move between the international, the domestic, regional, or, um, or even state level and still have opportunities open up in front of you that can be really compelling. Tony, I'm going to stop there and see what kinds of questions we have. So, Margaret, that's, that's a real tour de force covering so many things. And I think it's always good to give specific advice to students out there or to anybody who's interested in pursuing a different aspect of of their career. And I, I can't tell you how many students over the years have come to me saying, I want to go to law school, but I want to do X and I don't want to be a lawyer. And it's like, wait a minute, that, 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 you would never say that I, I, I don't want to be a doctor, but I want to go to med school. And so part of it is getting people to think creatively about the other career paths that exist. Uh, okay, well, I've got a couple of questions here and I'm going to combine one from uh, Ulrika Ekman and Tom uh, Solitaro 
are asking questions both about strategies and indications of success. So, so let me phrase it this way. Uh, assuming we want to counter, attack, eliminate structural racism, what strategies would we best implement as a country and how would we know we were being successful? What would be the indicators of success in trying to eliminate or eradicate or at least minimize structural racism? Well, Ulrika and Tom might be sitting on the, the walls of my conference room, my virtual conference room with my executive team, because we've been having that discussion a lot in the last few weeks. We are embarking on a new uh, impact statement for the SPLC, which is going to try to set quantifiable measures of progress on exactly those questions. So it will range. Um, if we're talking about, for example, the structural racism that exists in our voting processes, you can actually measure, well, how many people are we able to register in, in low propensity voting populations? How many of them actually turn out to vote in those elections? Um, and how many laws can we overturn that are that are created to try to stop the voting by as broad a participation as possible? So there are there are practical things like that to measure. What's of course much harder is when we're trying to counter um, ideology. It's hard to measure changes in ideology and the adherence of ideology, particularly when many people might not want to publicly acknowledge that they are adherents to that ideology. One of the things that we've started to do this year is we're starting to do an annual poll where we actually ask people about their views um, on a whole range of issues, as well as their views on structural racism, to try to get a sense over time as we continue to do this poll every year, do we see any shifts happening? Uh, this year, what we learned is that in spite of the very um, broadly supported protests about George Floyd's murder, and at the murder of so many other black men and women by police. By the end of the summer in August, when we were doing our polling, we saw a very substantial drop in the support, the public support for the protesters. And a lot of that was tied to messaging that folks had been hearing that the, the protests had contributed to violence or lack of safety in communities. And so that gives us some sense of what narrative was being effective uh, with those audiences and what are some of the things that we would have to address if we want people to understand why uh, so many folks resorted to protest about a situation that has persisted for decades. We also ask questions about why people think that um, there is so much poverty in the South or that why people believe that Blacks um, continue to have lower levels of income comparatively in, in the United States. And we were surprised that many people in the poll responded things like, well, we believe that um, people who are poor are lazy, or we believe that people who are poor aren't interested in working. And so it tells us that there are ways, there are narratives out there that are still very strong. And those are things that we can work on. We can work on doing educational curriculum for children. We can work on doing training for adult employees. Um, we can work on communication strategies and getting interesting people to join us in building a very different narrative. Those are all things that we'll be working on in the next few years to try to shift. But the measurement will be the interesting part. Can we use public polling as a way to tell if we're having an impact or not in the way people are perceiving different issues? Very good. A uh, Couple questions. Uh, I'm gonna combine some things here. We know that reconstruction after the American Civil War failed. It, it, it really did not serve the role of, of reconstructing and addressing the horrors of slavery and sort of rehabilitating things the, the way you might see it. As a consequence, and, and Maureen Parton raises a question about reparations. So, so let, me, let me put it in this, in this broader context. Do you think that the United States would benefit today from something like 
a Truth and Reconciliation Commission with a discussion of, of reparations? And, and how would that be and what format might that take? I appreciate that question so much, Maureen. Thank you. Yes, I do believe it. <laughs> uh, in fact, if you visit the SPLC's website, which is splcenter.org, you can see that we've put out a transition document for the new Biden administration. And one of our recommendations is that we actually need to create an executive truth and reconciliation process. Um, I know that the Biden team is actually considering the creation of, a, of an interagency group on civil rights, um, which we hope might be the home for such an effort. But I think reparations will have to be part of that discussion. Um, the truth part is though very important as well. We have never collectively as a country agreed upon what the truth is. Uh, and we have never reconciled what has been the experience for so many Americans over the last couple of centuries. If we can't do that, it's impossible then to work together on how we move forward. So those are critical first pieces that have to be done. Reparations could take a lot of different measures. Reparations could be in terms of recognizing that we need to provide access to education, to healthcare, to services that right now don't exist for so many, for so many communities of color, for so many poor people in the country. And by focusing on the stories of what has happened, particularly to black and indigenous communities in the US, it gives us a chance to then understand how what their experience today is like is connected to that history. And that might help demonstrate the ways in which reparations can be most meaningful. Um, because most likely it's going to be in thinking about the underlying disparities, the underlying challenges that have never been addressed, the way that reconstruction was intended to do and unfortunately failed to do. Great. Now, let me, let me do a slight follow-up. You mentioned the Biden administration. So what we're seeing happening over the next couple of months, I guess, is the unfolding of the administration, uh, new appointments to the cabinet, sub-cabinet level officers, and all of us have been just fascinated by seeing the individuals that are going, including uh, a number of our Georgetown friends and colleagues uh, like Linda Thomas-Greenfield going to the United Nations. What advice from your perspective would you give to the Biden administration right now on addressing questions of, of justice, of equity, of inclusion? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. Uh, I would probably reinstitute all of the trainings that were cut this fall for government agencies on how to be thinking and talking about these issues. I think talking about race is a huge challenge for our country. We all confront not only our own personal experience that each of us has had, but we also confront the legacy of people who might be in our demographic or community. And we also confront the legacy of people we care about who've had a very different experience. And so with that kind of context, particularly for young people, you know, young people are growing up in a very different country than the one I grew up. It is far more diverse for my children who are teenagers. Um, their experience of diversity in this country is much richer, very positive, very welcoming. Uh, and that's, that's not the case uh, with the way that I grew up in the country. But the expectation is different. And so I think the administration has done a very nice job of acknowledging the importance of representation, of diversity in the, the appointments that they've made to date, but that's not gonna be enough. Um, that's the first step. That's an important first step. But what happens next is really listening to all of the voices that need to be heard in the development of policy and ensuring that different perspectives are brought to bear so that when a decision is made um, by ambassador, uh, by the ambassador to the UN uh, about what position the United States should take, 
that it's not coming from one perspective or one one angle on the situation, but that they've actually heard from a range of different voices and different expectations to make that policy as strong as possible. I think that um, one of the things that the administration is going to have to do is also to to consider how to keep engaging with the larger public. I know that when uh, President Obama was in office, his White House had a policy that if you could get 25,000 signatures on a petition, somebody in the White House would be assigned to look at the issue and, and take it up. And while that's not a perfect system, there is something about that option of getting issues in front of the people who are making decisions every day and ensuring that there is some attention to something that is that's capturing enough interest from enough people in the country that they have to take a look at it. And I hope that kind of open dialogue will continue. I hope there'll be channels for input from across the country. Great. Uh, you, you mentioned Linda Thomas-Greenfield, and one question that often comes up is, what role the United States should play abroad in promoting human rights? And it's it's been a challenge because when other countries look at the United States and say, you're violating human rights by doing this, this, and this, how can you be a beacon to the world? How can you play a role? And over the past several years, we've seen the United States pull out of the Human Rights Council, We've seen the United States disengage in a number of, of human rights activities. Uh, what specific advice might you give to her? Might you give to Linda Thomas Greenfield and uh, Secretary, presumably uh, confirmed and presumably confirmed Secretary of State Tony Blinken about how they might position the United States as a state that can promote human rights globally? Well, I think. No one ever likes to receive advice from somebody who thinks they know it all. <laughs> so I think the, the key is to acknowledge that we're all imperfect and that we're all doing the best that we can, but that it is the principles of human rights um, that are universally agreed upon that should be driving the decisions. I would never presume to give either uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield or Tony Blinken my counsel on this, although I'd, if they ask, of course, I'd love to. But my, my sense is there are people across the world who perceive what the United States has done well in the past, and that is on civil and political rights. We have demonstrated how important it is in, in that arena. We have done much poorer on the economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, and this might be a time to reset. While we might have things to share about how we've been able to protect a certain group of human rights in the United States, we have a lot to learn from other countries on how they've done far better to protect their poorest communities, to protect, um, to protect economic and social rights that are very, very hard to come by here. And that kind of approach might actually win a lot more people because it is the it is the acknowledgement of the growth together that is actually the most compelling way to start working together. I think that's a very interesting point because as you know, the United States kind of denied the existence of economic, social, and cultural rights. We did not or have not yet ratified the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. The first sort of inkling of a change really came with Jimmy Carter in 1977 Cyrus Vance, who was Secretary of State, gave a famous Law Day speech where he okay. incorporated economic and social rights. But now that we talk more explicitly about health care as a right, that, that's much more uh, commonly accepted. Not that necessarily everyone, but it's much more commonly accepted than it would have been in, in 1977 or 1966, say, when the covenant was actually drafted. Do you think maybe a Biden administration should push forward to try to get the United States to ratify? the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights? Well, let me say uh, ratification has never guaranteed practice. Uh, and the fact that we've ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights did not stop torture, did not stop arbitrary detention. So ratification is not the ultimate goal. <laughs> that said, of absolutely, they should push for ratification of that covenant. And I think even beyond healthcare, which I agree with you, the language and the belief in healthcare as a human right has evolved significantly 
since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. You have to remember too that the right to education, while not acknowledged federally, is in nearly every state constitution of the United States. People believe in a right to public education up through high school. So there are elements of the economic and social and cultural rights covenant that we have accepted, we have integrated into our, our social norms. And I think we're at a point where perhaps with this pandemic, we could rethink what our commitment is. Maybe our commitment needs to be more than um, simply dismissing these things as socialist ideas or communist ideas and rather really thinking about the kind of society we want to be in where we don't allow the poorest among us to face the the levels of problems that we currently have excellent and i i really appreciate your saying that simple ratification doesn't mean implementation it doesn't mean internalization at all necessarily uh sometimes students of international law think oh well, if we've got a treaty then everything's fine it's like Everything may be the complete opposite of being fine. You may think because you've got a treaty that you don't actually need to work hard to make those rights a reality. Well, you mentioned education, and this is going to be our, our last, believe it or not, our last question. And it's from, uh, I believe she was also one of your classmates, Kelly Mulvoy Mangan, uh, a friend of mine who has sat on the Board of Governors of the Georgetown University Alumni Association and it, it, uh, will, will be the, the president-elect of the Georgetown University alumni, or is the president-elect, is, is a great, great person. And she asks that you maybe talk a little bit about specifically the work that you are doing, your organization is doing, in elementary, middle, and high schools in this area. That's great. Thanks, Kelly, for the question. So we started a program in the 1990s that at the time was well-named. It was called Teaching Tolerance. Um, and I'm happy to give a preview to all of you. We've just decided to rename the program because we no longer think that teaching tolerance is enough. Our new program will be called Learning for Justice. This program creates curriculum for elementary, middle, and high school students. I think there's even some college level curriculum. And we offer professional training for teachers across the country. The curriculum is designed to help students deal with hard history and address subjects like race that are very difficult to talk about in the classroom. And so there are different curricula, depending on what you're interested in, where you can learn as a teacher or even as a parent or community member, what could you be talking about with young people to help them understand where we have come from, what our history is, and how we build a better democracy today. Uh, we just hired a new head of this program, Learning for Justice, and she's going to be joining us in January. And we'll be focusing quite a bit more, I believe, on educational equity across the country. And so using the curriculum and working with schools and with students across the country, but also building a constituency for understanding how education can actually lead to much better outcomes for all of society, not just for the individuals in the schools. That's excellent. Well, we have two minutes left. So Margaret, would you like to make a few concluding comments to, to motivate us uh, so that we can all go out there and, and hopefully make, make the world a better place? <laughs> well, thank you, Tony. Thank you for having me today. This was a great deal of fun. I think I would just encourage all of you to recognize two things. One is, the last year and this pandemic has been extraordinarily difficult. It has laid bare so many of the problems in our country. It has forced us to deal with family members who are the only people we ever see in person <laughs> in new ways. Um, it has challenged us in terms of how we work and where we work and whether we even are able to work. And in spite of all that, we are going to come out of this year and this pandemic, and we have an opportunity to take what we've learned from this process to, to make a real change happen. I was incredibly inspired by the protest last summer and that so many young people from so many different walks of life became mobilized and activated to take a stand on something. It's my hope that as an older generation, 
that I t follow their lead. I become a follower of young people and that we really think about how to support and lift up the messages about what they care about. And that's the opportunity that all of us have is that we can be part of making that change happen. Uh, we can we can observe, we can admire from afar, but there are things that we can do as well. And if any of you are ever looking for things you can do, uh, right now we are encouraging volunteers to call voters in Georgia and to let them know that they have another election coming up on January 5th. So if you're interested in a power hour opportunity to call voters in Georgia, you can find that at our website as well. That's splcenter.org. Uh, SPLC really appreciate the time to talk with all of you. M Margaret, thank you very, very much for a, a wonderful conversation and, and very stimulating and, and hopefully motivating to those folks out there. So thank you very, very much. And, and you were talking about listening to the young people. You're still a young person. You're still <laughs> a young person. So we, we, we should think of it that way. Uh, I, want, I want to thank Dean Hellman for the welcome and for talking about some of the important things. There he is that, that Georgetown uh, is going to be doing. And I know there are going to be ways that all of us can work with the School of Foreign Service and the rest of the Georgetown community in that area. I want to thank Kelly Young of the Georgetown University Alumni Association for making all this happen. And Eleanor Monty Jones, who conceived of this idea of SFS online and on topic. We will see all of you, I hope, and more in the new year in 2021 for a whole other series of SFS online and on topic. Have a great day and have wonderful holidays. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you Thanks, all. Tom.